start with that. So, welcome everyone. A new kinesiology college presents <laughs> the importance of natural medicine for Natural Medicine Week 2023. So, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, why our healthcare system needs natural medicine and the role that it plays and how we're an important piece of an overall system that sometimes gets lost in um, media and things like that. And now the slides don't want to move along. Why is that? Anyway. So um, just to let you know my background for those um, listening to this who haven't ever met me before. So I started my career as a scientist um, and that still sits with me. I'm a teacher and I've worked in complementary medicine for a long time and right now I'm halfway to becoming a researcher. So hopefully I can play a role in transforming people's perceptions of natural medicine. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is just some physiological stuff so that you can understand what actually happens in the body. Why do we become unwell um, instead of staying healthy? So um, this theory, um, Hans Salings actually was nominated for the Nobel Prize for this theory in the 1960s. And it came about once we knew about our endocrine system, our hormones. So we have hundreds of physiological functions in our body. And rather than staying at a set amount, like your temperature does not stay at a set amount at all times, because we constantly have input that's altering these functions. So what actually happens is they fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down. And we want them to fluctuate around what is called our optimal level. So when we experience distress, what it does is it throws physiological functions outside their normal homeostatic limits. As you can see in this picture, somebody going through distress in one function. And so when a stressor actually throws us outside our normal homeostatic limits, that's what we call distress. That is something that has an impact on our functioning that we will notice. Um, and so when that happens, our body immediately um, instigates various physiological compensations in order to bring that function back into its normal functioning. And then we go about our life as if nothing happened. So if that happens, that's a stage one stress, not a big deal, it happens all the time and our body copes with it. You know, you walk out, it's freezing cold and your body starts to shiver, create goosebumps and all of that is to warm you up and stop your body temperature dropping too low. So these kind of things just happen every day without you really even noticing. The problem is if that distress is very large or ongoing. So if it's very large, that's normally when you end up with a medical doctor intervening to keep you alive. <laughs> and it's what's more important for us really in our everyday life is more common is that the stress is ongoing. So the stress keeps happening and the body can't actually compensate and bring it back to optimum. And... So what it, the body will try to bring it back to optimum and after a certain point it goes, okay, this is not good. <laughs> if I don't do something, we're dying and your body's number one priority is to keep you alive. Thank goodness. So that's when you enter stage two stress, what Hayne Saley is called the stage of resistance. So at this stage, um, we have an ongoing stressor. The body hasn't been able to deal with it and bring us back to um, optimum. So it goes, okay, compromise. And what it does is it creates longer term compensations and it resets optimum. So instead of that function in your body now fluctuating around optimum, it resets it and fluctuates around a new level. And it goes, okay, well, we're not getting um, the body temperature back there. We'll focus on getting it here. With, and that new level is within homeostatic limits. So you're not going to die in the near future. However, it's not optimum. So it actually, so you're resisting an ongoing stressor, you're coping with it, but actually your body is using huge amounts of energy in these ongoing compensations. So to keep that function going at that different level actually uses huge amounts of energy. And so you can do it and it keeps you alive. However, you're not going to live forever in that state. At some point, your body's going to not be coping and 
So this is what I like to call the stage of compensation. Um, what actually, so you can understand at stage one stress, you know something's not right. You have symptoms and you are in distress and you know there is a problem. When your body reaches stage two stress and it's compensating, or you, this last point on this slide is the one to really pay attention to, the bodily signs characteristic of the alarm reaction have virtually disappeared. Your symptoms have mostly disappeared. So now you think you're fine, but you are not fine. <laughs> This should only be a short-term state and where most people have physiological functions that are highly compromised going on every day, every day, every day. So you appear fine, but there are minor signs, like you don't wake up feeling good every day. You wake up going, oh, God, another day. You're tighter than you used to be. Um, you might um, have you know, feeling funny in your tummy, you might be getting constipation, diarrhea, like all these things that people live with in their daily life because it's not big enough problem to worry about are signs that you're in stage two stress and you're not at optimum anymore in at least one, if not multiples of your physiological functions. So it's important to understand that stage two stress, you appear fine, but you're not. <laughs> so then... What happens if we stay in that highly compensated state for too long and we can live in a highly compensated state for decades and just struggle through life, not really having a great time, but I'm still alive. And um, after at some point, your body will break down and you'll enter stage three stress, which Hanzo is called the stage of exhaustion. So Energy is constantly being expended to keep you in this compensated state, the stage of resistance. But at some point, this borrowing of energy um, runs out and the actual um, physiological or organ system collapses. And then you have avert illness again, like stage one. It's obvious I've got symptoms. So then we enter, when we enter stage three, once again, it's obvious that we are unwell. We're going to take action. However, for some people, when we enter um, stage three stress, it's too late. They're now diagnosed with stage four cancer and there's no coming back or something, you know. Um, my favourite one is always when people say, oh, I just bent over and my back went out, as if that's normal. Your back does not just suddenly go out because everything was fine and my entire musculoskeletal system was all in alignment and then I bent over to pick up a pen. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I'm not in alignment. That's not how it works. So you had to have been highly compensated for a long period prior to suddenly have an issue. So that's kind of what a lot of people go, oh, I suddenly got unwell. Nobody suddenly gets unwell unless, like, you got hit by a car. Yes, I'll give you, you suddenly got unwell. But if there was no obvious physical intervention, your physiology shouldn't suddenly not work how it should be. So it's actually years of compensation breaking down and I become unwell. And we don't want to get to stage three stress. We don't want our clients and people out there in the world to be getting to stage three stress because sometimes that's irreversible. We want to help them before they hit stage three stress. So um, this is a concept that I've taken from lots of different places and combined different ideas into my own little picture. <laughs> so we live on a continuum. Our health lives on a continuum between illness and wellness. So obviously we want to be thriving at that end in wellness. Um, so we want to be up here thriving away in wellness with no physiological distress. So it's important to understand, and I think it's very important for everyone to understand, to be a wise healthcare consumer, it's important to understand what Australia's healthcare system is like. Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand that when we discovered the endocrine system, we learnt what I've just told you about with Hans Salis, that there are two distinct points where our health deteriorates. There's the point where we go from thriving to surviving. So this line here, this is where we have the initial breakdown of physiological function and we go into compensation, stage two stress. Now we're surviving. So we're not gonna die in the near future 
but we're certainly on a train that's taking us closer to death quicker than if we were thriving. So we've now taken some years off our life or days, probably initially. <laughs> so this is an important physiological change. But then there's the point at which those compensations break down and we go from surviving to overtly unwell, okay? Now, the um, Western medical system had a choice to make. Which of these two points of physiological change do we want to focus on? And they chose to focus on this one where you go from surviving to overtly unwell. Why? Because actually it's a much easier point to diagnose. Okay, so if I go back here a little bit, you'll notice in this picture that most of the time this function is within the homeostatic limits, which means nothing um, really bad is going to happen to you. But it does dip outside those homeostatic limits, which causes your other systems of your body stress. So I go and get a blood test pretty high chance when they do that blood test that this function will fall within the normal limits most of the I have to be real lucky that they did the blood test at that moment when this function dipped outside and the doctor will go oh this function is not normal pretty good chance when they do that blood test I'm going to fall within normal homeostatic limits and they're going to go oh if you're in the normal range you're okay so it's only when I hit stage three stress and I'm outside those limits all the time <laughs> that a blood test is going to point that out. So that's an important piece to keep in mind is actually they chose this line for Western medicine because you can easily diagnose people with the kind of diagnostic tests that are easy to run. And you don't have to spend as long doing health assessments and talking to the patient. So it makes the system more efficient. Mm -hmm. So that is why Western medicine is a disease-based model. That's not a criticism. That is literally the truth that it's written about in scientific papers. It's a disease-based model. They are looking at, will you die in the near future? Are you overtly unwell? And that's fine. They're allowed to pick that point and do that. But as a person, a patient going to my doctor, I should know that and I should be aware of that. And I should understand if I'm not feeling well, chances are something is wrong. Whether or not my doctor wants to do anything about it is probably depends how bad it is. So I might need to consider other healthcare professionals to go to who have the capacity bought into, built into their model of healthcare to give me the time to perhaps look at this line where I move from thriving to surviving. Okay, so it's an important consumer point when we're out there as a patient. So if I'm thriving, I don't need any healthcare professional intervention. I can use lifestyle medicine and stay well. How many people in Western society does that encompass? Not that many. Most people in our modern day society are surviving. And so they could really use a natural medicine practitioner or two helping them to move out of stage two compensation and back into no physiological distress. Um, if we don't do that, we're going to become overtly unwell at some point and we're going to need Western medicine to then probably intervene um, because we're now overtly unwell and we're going to have to deal with the problem quickly or we could be heading to death and we don't want that. So this is the different parts of healthcare that these different types of medicine are operating with. You know, if I've got nothing wrong with me, lifestyle medicine will help prevent me becoming unwell. But if I, my stresses have gotten too high at some points, I've entered compensation, I'm going to need a natural medicine practitioner if I don't want to then become a burden on the medical system and have to have higher level interventions to get well again. So natural medicine plays this really important role because, A, they provide education about prevention. <laughs> B, they provide interventions to help move people from surviving back to thriving so they don't end up with overt illness. And that potentially lessens the burdens on hospitals, medical doctors, and saves taxpayers a lot of money than if we end up in hospital needing higher-level interventions. 
So just a little bit about evidence-based healthcare, because this is one of the biggest criticisms of natural medicine is that, oh, well, it's not evidence-based, which is, so let's talk about well, what does evidence-based mean? <laughs> so this comes from um, a paper written back when evidence-based medicine was first becoming a thing in the 90s, okay? So evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. Good doctors use both individual clinical expertise and the best available external evidence and never, neither is alone is ever enough. Without clinical expertise, practice risks becoming tyrannised by evidence. So even excellent external evidence may be inapplicable to or inappropriate for an individual patient. Just because a particular intervention has been researched and shown to be better than placebo in a group of people or multiple groups of people does not mean the individual patient sitting in front of that doctor will benefit from that intervention. The doctor has to analyse that particular patient's health status, genetics, lifestyle, age, sex, all these factors and determine whether the intervention will be appropriate for them. You know, because there is zero interventions on this planet in healthcare that help 100% of people. <laughs> so this paper also says, also says the opposite, that just um, using um, clinical expertise without also being informed by external evidence is not good either, just to be transparent. <laughs> I don't want to have too many words on the slide, but it is, I, I really think this last point is the point that we're going through. People will say, oh, no, well, it's evidence-based, as if that means it's going to help everyone. And that is never the case for any therapy ever in existence. So it's important to remember that it should always be about the individual person and being informed by the research. Um, most of medicine is not evidence-based. It hasn't been scientifically studied in a placebo-controlled randomised clinical trial. Most of it is actually best practice. It's known to be the best way to deal with something in the medical system. Um, so the idea that everything your doctor does is evidence-based is actually not true. <laughs> So I, these are just some points that I think everyone needs to know to be a discerning healthcare consumer, and I think it's good to educate our clients and the people in our influence. So there's a biostatistician at Stanford University, John Iomidis. He just looks at the numbers. He's not swayed by any bias, which is unusual in the scientific community. And um, he actually looked at it, and what he found when he did, delved in is that most published research findings are false. They cannot be reproduced. Large majority of it can never be reproduced. This is a tiny little fraction that when it's done again in another circumstance with another group of people, they get the same result that the first people got. Most of it's... So just because it's published in a peer-reviewed journal doesn't mean it's right. You can be more discerning than that. Um, Another thing most people don't know is that for pharmaceutical trials, when they go through peer review to get into a journal, the reviewers don't get access to the raw data to, to analyse it themselves. They just get the analysis that the pharmaceutical company did in the first place. So, you know, if, the, if there was something done to manipulate the raw data, but, you know, in that analysis process, maybe they didn't do the, actually the right analysis, whether, whether intentional or unintentional, the peer reviewers don't get to see that and make that call. Um, doctors are actually taught in medical school that 50% of what they're learning will be outdated within five years of them being in practice. But then nobody knows which 50%. <laughs> so every doctor out there has a limited knowledge, like every human has a limited knowledge. They are not the all-seeing oracle of healthcare. They're a human who has a certain amount of knowledge. And you don't know what they've bothered to keep up with or not, because there is honestly, science and healthcare are constantly evolving changes. Our understanding of human beings and health changes every single day on this planet, and nobody can keep up with it all. Nobody could ever. I mean, if you literally spent every day keeping up, you'd have no time to see a patient. 
That is literally what they say. So you've got to understand um, they're always limited in their knowledge and you should always do your own research for your life and your health, despite what has sort of been in the mainstream media that people should not be doing their own research. Actually, I just completely disagree with that. I think you should be delving in and asking tough questions. <laughs> so uh, a very recent, um, was this 2016 in the British Medical Journal, um, a researcher wrote that prescription drugs are now the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer in the world. So, um, so you've got to do your research. Medicine is not an exact science. It is an applied science. It is the science of human beings and a social science, and it is a constantly evolving science. So um, Dr. Asim Maholtra said that in an interview recently, and I love it. I think that sums it up. People think that science and healthcare or medicine are facts. It's just based on facts, and that is just not true. Our understanding is constantly evolving and changing, and we need to keep looking. What does the data tell us? What does the data tell us? And most people can't do that for themselves. They have to trust others to do it, and that is a challenge. So very simple, to live a healthy life, I personally believe you need to be self-responsible. You need to take charge of your life and your health and make self-responsible choices to be healthy. <laughs> And you should not rely on other people to tell you what to do. Um, so a Danish twin study from quite a long time ago actually established that 20% of how long we live is dictated by our genes. 80% of its life, about 80% of its lifestyle. So actually your choices every day are determining how long you will live. No use blaming other things. <laughs> um, and in the research, they, they found that... The more healthy lifestyle choices a person adopts, the lower their risk of death becomes. So you add days to your life every time you make more healthy choices each day. You can literally add days to your life today. <laughs> so healthy habits to adopt. Look, there's a lot of different research that I've looked at over the years, um, you know, things to do with um, preventing Alzheimer's, live at the what they call blue zones where people live on average to over 100, um, all sorts of different things that I've read. And I felt like this summarised overall those healthy things. It does vary from thing to thing and how they word it varies. Moderate regular exercise. Um, some say daily, some say three times a week of longer each time. So, But that regular exercise is known to be helpful. Maintaining a desirable weight for your height, eat nutrient-dense foods and don't overeat, sleeping seven or eight hours per day. Develop routines to shed stress. Stress causes our cells to age. <laughs> so you will encounter stress. That is just life. That is part of life. You will encounter stress. You have to develop ways to let stress go, whatever that may look like. And different um, research shows different things. Um, follow a purpose in life. That comes up across the research. And belong to communities of people who support and love you. And that can look different um, for different groups. So... Um, Another one is um, neuroplasticity research. So there's this lady who's really a pioneer of women in science in the 90s who did huge amounts of research on neuroplasticity and definitively showed our brains do not just deteriorate with age, that actually we can grow new um, pathways in, in our nervous system. And she found five things for a healthy brain. That is five things that drive new brain plasticity in a positive direction. Newness and challenge. So you need to be doing things that you enjoy that challenge you all throughout life. And most people stop doing that as they age. Exercise and diet, they pretty much show everywhere. And love. The final thing she found, accidentally almost, was love. Love is good for our brain. What a concept. <laughs> So really, I just want to point out that natural medicine has a really important role. Even though each individual could actually keep themselves healthy through healthy habits, most people don't. Most people struggle to do those healthy things every day. 
And that's where I think natural medicine plays a really important role because they can, most people don't even know they need to do these healthy habits. And natural medicine practitioners educate people on that. They educate how simple being healthy could be if you just make right choices and help give them ways that they could implement them. Because a lot of people struggle to implement these healthy habits. And so a natural medicine practitioner often helps in that space. Um, they also provide interventions that can change one's ability to implement them. So they can help us clear stress and make changes that help us then make those better choices. Instead of being in sabotage and making really poor choices every day, they, a natural medicine practitioner can help us um, actually change our way of functioning so we do make those choices. And they also provide interventions that help reduce stress, which improves our physiological function, reduces inflammation and makes healthy habits easy easier to maintain. So without natural medicine practitioners, we actually end up with a very sick society relying very heavily on high level interventions. With natural medicine practitioners, we end up with people able to shift themselves from being in surviving back to thriving. And that's what we want. We want a self-responsible society that stays healthy <laughs> and happy. <laughs> Thank you.